Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and thanks for joining us on Likeable Science, where we're going to talk about another uh, aspect of science here, another application in, that's uh, making waves here in Hawaii, and we'd like to be making waves around the world. Uh, I have with me today uh, David Takayama and Mark Kimura, both from Oceanet. Welcome, guys. Uh, David's their head of the uh, IT and uh, has a master's in urban regional planning. Uh, runs the uh, uh, Innovation Consulting Group, I guess there, is that what they call it? Yeah. And uh, Mark's a senior scientist with a, a master's in uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, he works on uh, machine learning, I guess you could say, right? Yeah. Excellent. So, and just in case our audience may not know Oceanit, can we say just a few words about what Oceanit is? It's a, a mine to market company, I gather. Yeah, we're a diversified engineering and technology company. We have a philosophy of mind to market, so any ideas that we have, we like to find ways to bring it out into the marketplace. Yeah, no, it's great. It's sort of all in one house, right? You, you, you think of some good idea and all the way up to hand it off to somebody to actually manufacture this product or process and run with it, right? Right. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's, that's great. It's, it's, a, it's a proven good model to get. We've got, Ocean has gotten a lot of good stuff out there already, right? You've gotten a lot of different products out over the years and processes. And we're going to talk about a, a current project. I guess this is, was been developed with Department of Energy funding, do I understand? Is that... yeah, yeah, so we got a grant from the Department of Energy, but you know, my background, I'm actually not. I've worked for Oceanet for over 20 years. Mm -hmm but I was like managing projects, doing business development, and Oceanet has a philosophy that anybody in the company can submit proposals. Mm -hmm. So I was bored, so I submitted a proposal <laughs> to the federal government for a grant, mm -hmm. and it was a mashup of technologies that was developed within Oceanet, and part of it included machine vision. Uh -huh. So I submitted this grant, and we got funded. Wow. And I was <laughs> pleasantly surprised, and uh -huh. then once we got funded, then we had to figure out how do we how do we do it? <laughs> so, I've been in that, that situation, yeah. You say, well, we'll do this. They say, good, here's the money. Oh, now we've got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we developed a proof of concept. But basically, mm -hmm. Department of Energy's problem, the problem is, is after a major disaster, when power goes out, you know, there was a study that was done that when power goes out, it affects about $170 billion worth, worth of dollars of reach for power outages throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And there's a study that said that nine out of 10 people in this world would die with the extended power outage because of its effect on water supply, uh, cooling, mm -hmm. and other things. So it's a big problem. Right, and, and so, yeah, a storm comes through, knocks down power lines, knocks over trees. And part of the issue then is, right, somebody's gotta come in and figure out, like, how big a workforce do we need? What, what materials do we need to fix all this, right? Exactly. That's, that's a labor-intensive business, right? Exactly. I think your first photo that we have here uh, sort, of, sort of shows a scope of it, right? Here's people inspecting this. And obviously, if you get a couple of guys out there sort of going pole to pole to pole, that's going to take a long time, right? Yeah, so this is the traditional way right. of how it's done. Right. But After it's, a major disaster, yeah, yeah, people still manually go out, do a damage assessment, and then come back to the office and report out. And every minute, you know, counts when there's a disaster. Sure, and if hospitals are out of power, you know, they're running on emergency generators, keeping people life support, right. uh, you know, uh, refrigeration units for food are, are down, that means that food is starting to spoil very quickly. Yeah, you can't pump water into your reservoirs. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a thousand things that can go wrong, right? So, um, what, what, was the, what was the idea? You guys teamed up then, right? Yeah, so our technology is to use machine vision to help quickly identify damaged, uh, you know, damaged grid infrastructure very quickly so that the decision makers can, they know where to allocate resources most efficiently and quickly. And maybe if we could queue up that video, Mark can explain a little bit about our technology. Sure. Okay, so tell us where, where this is and what's going on here. So this is actual video footage from, uh, uh, I think, Hurricane Hajabi. 
Okay. And it was about uh, one week to 10 days after the, the disaster. Mm -hmm. And what we, so what we're looking at here is that uh, whenever you see a green box like that, it means uh, the pole is intact, it's standing. Mm -hmm. And then we just missed it, but then there was a, um, a red box that was uh, lying on the ground. That means the machine vision R model R system um, actually detected a down pole. Huh. So, um, so we're using a deep learning and AI system to detect those uh, uh, poles. As you can see, there are some confusing uh, elements like trees, um, but our system is not detecting those. We're just detecting, um, you know, poles like that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a messy, messy landscape, a lot of visual noise, right. and, and, and it's amazing. I think thing. See, it's, there's a, a red uh, box right there. On the, on the down one, right. yeah, okay. So the, the, you're... Machine then can tell you for a given a given area, and this is all done via a drone, right? Exactly. And so as you can tell, um, you know, like a machine vision today, it's just so smart that you know it's almost as good as human brains now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's then a question of teaching it, you know, what what to look for and right. what, what to ignore, right. uh, what kind of features a standing pole versus a down pole have, right? Right. So what we're looking at right here is uh, using the system that we developed, uh, the code name uh, EOBU, actually. So this is a kind of a, um, we, we are using the same technology, but it's a, it's a, we developed this for demo purpose and experimental purpose. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, in the background, you see a, like a model mm -hmm. street with a, with a pole standing, the other one uh, lying down. Mm -hmm. So the drone has a little camera, and that's uh, the, the laptop right there, and the drone is communicating mm -hmm. uh, to control the drone, also receiving the videos. And on the screen, you can see that uh, we have um, up pole and down pole as well. Right. Yeah, and so the, the, this is, you have to teach the machine right. to distinguish these things. Exactly. To, to, and, and, and it's real time like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's really fast today. Mm -hmm. So Mark makes it look easy, but it, this is an extremely oh. difficult problem. If you look at that first video with all the debris, there's right. a lot of things that look like trees. It's right. a, yeah, there's palm trees that look rather much like telephone poles. Uh, there's street lines on the street that may look like down holes, and, and your machine has to learn to reliably distinguish among all these things, right? And that's a matter, to some extent, of this sort of, I don't want to say exactly trial and error learning, but, but it's, it's, it's a teaching process, right? Yes. Your initial run through is the machine probably misidentifies a bunch of stuff, and you have to go through and tell it what, what it got wrong, right? And gradually, then it learns. That's what the machine learning right. is about. Literally, you know, machine learning. Yes. Until it gets better and better and better at detecting exactly. just what it is you want. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I'm, what I'm finding out too in learning is that this machine machine learning is as much an art as it is a science. Right. And I thought you could just feed images into the system, but what Mark is actually an artist, I think, as well <laughs> as a scientist. Right. Yeah, it's, well, that's, that's the beauty of it. And, and now what this sort of illustrates is you're taking these various different technologies, right? The computer vision, mm -hmm. machine learning, and drone technologies, right. and sort of mashing them all together. Yeah, it's all really, together. really exciting to them yeah. creatively and, and productively. Exactly. And it's really, really exciting to mm -hmm. see actual science, cutting edge science, being used for purposes like this to help people. Right, exactly. This is this is why I thought you guys would be so great here on Likeable Science, because this this is you know this is a really great application of, of some cutting edge science that people right. have are just now really figuring out how to make these things work together right. and it has a clear understandable purpose. We can see exactly. disaster relief is, is so, a big thing. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, David and I visited a small town in Texas the other day. Uh, was it La Lagrange, I think? Yeah. And there were like a small community where um, it's, it's hard to reach places. Mm -hmm. And we, get, we got to see in all those places and to see people. So it gives a lot of meaning to do it. You know? Yeah. No, I, I had a good, good friend who was in Tallahassee, got brushed by Hurricane Harvey, and yeah, they said there were down poles and down trees all over the place and caused trouble. And again, the faster, as you point out, the faster it can be identified, the faster you can get the right resources, the right numbers of people, the right kinds of people, the right equipment in there to fix things, right? Yeah, it made a big difference. I mean, Mark and I, we were, doing the technical research and you know developing this, but until we actually went there and talked to people who experienced being in a disaster, mm -hmm. it gave it a lot more meaning for us, I think. Yeah, yeah, and again, you, you see this importance of time if you look back at uh, Puerto Rico, right, when the initial estimates right after the hurricane hit were, you know, 50, 60 people had been killed, and later on that got, they basically amped that number up to several thousand, right, because yeah, people died from subsequent lack of power, uh, 
as well as their, I'm sure they found more people who had been killed outright immediately, but uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of those deaths were later, but directly related. Right, and in the case of Puerto Rico, um, gathering drone data was not an issue. Right. There was a, tons of drone d data. The problem was is the image processing speed. Huh. It took so long to process the data to figure out what everything meant, what the data meant, that that's what slowed people down. Huh. So with technologies like this, where it can be almost real time or near, near real time even, the image processing is very quick, where mm -hmm. we can get results um, very quickly. Yeah, if, if you're, if you're, you can, you've taught your machine to do the, the recognition and the sorting of the initial data, so you don't have to have manually sort through hours and hours and hours of pointless video, right? The machine's already basically flown over and, and can tell you, look here, look here, look here, look here, right? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure in Puerto Rico there are other problems in terms of just getting the resources to it after, after they identified it, but uh, which is often another another mm -hmm. challenge. But this is certainly. This project illustrates a really nice, big first leap in terms of being able to get get the response moving much more quickly now. You know, I think uh, this is very relevant to Hawaii, especially, right? Uh, because I mean, Oahu hasn't really experienced a major hurricane or you know typhoon or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it, it, it always misses just by a little bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Eventually, it's going to happen, especially because of the climate change, and eventually, oh. something could really happen. And also, uh, before uh, joining Ocean, I was living in the Big Island. Mm -hmm. I saw people. I saw my friends. Dealing with, uh, say, you know, uh, uh, you know, those hurricanes and the lava flow. Mm -hmm. So I know how much how much it means for people in rural areas to be able to see the government working really fast and faster to help them. Yeah. So it's really personal myself to myself as well. No, you're you're quite right. Yeah. The, the issue in Hawaii, or here in Oahu, yeah. particularly, is yes, if we do have major uh, disaster, the, right. the the timing is going to become critical yeah. because we have very limited reserves of food, right. water. Etc. And we're going to need to know very quickly just how bad things are, just what, just what's needed. And so, again, a technology like this would be incredibly valuable. Yeah, but it really, you know, it goes it goes beyond just this sort of disaster relief and, and uh, sort of categorization process, right? I mean, the, these once you begin to think about these technologies and putting them together, you suddenly realize that there are a lot of things you can do with this, right? Right. Exactly. I, I mean, it gets into the whole issue of self-driving cars, which, of course, are using exactly the same kind of stuff, right? They have to be able to recognize a wide range of things and make decisions based on that recognition as to what, what to do about that, whether to stop, to run over it, to swerve around it, or whatever, right? Yeah, so our philosophy of what we talked about, the mind to market. Mm -hmm. So we use, often use government-funded projects to you know, get up to speed on a new technology, build mm -hmm. up the technology. But often the application of that technology into a market is often something it could be totally different from the original concept that we developed it for. Mm -hmm. And that's both market driven and it involves talking to people and understanding what real life problems are for. So we love doing that to find out what problems are and how technology be, can be used to apply. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that always happens technologies, right? They get developed for one process or one goal, and then people take them and start using them for other things. Usually, usually that's for good. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the whole, you know, the folks who developed the original technology for the internet could not envision what the internet has become, right? And how broadly it's being used for all these different things. So um, can, can, can we, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I, I think we're probably coming right up on a, on a break here, but maybe uh, we can think about this over the break. When we come back, we can talk a little bit more about some of the other some of these other applications and, and ways that you guys are thinking about it. That other people are thinking about using computer vision or other sensing technologies in collaboration with machine learning to make products that'll uh, help mankind. All right, um, we're going to go off for a break here. Uh, Mark Kimura and David Takayama, both from OceanNet, and I'm your host Ethan Allen. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of. Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. 
Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. And with me today in the Think Tech studios are David Takayama and Mark Kimura, both from Oceanit, uh, a senior scientist and IT director. And we've been talking about a, a project they've been working on uh, in conjunction with the Department of Energy to, for a sort of disaster relief uh, to basically combine computer, computer vision with machine learning to help identify the uh, power grid infrastructure that's been damaged. Look at poles, power poles, and say which ones are up, which ones are down. Get some estimate on how much, how much supplies you need where, basically, how much manpower you're gonna need where to fix everything. But as we said just before the, the break, this, clearly, this melding of technology goes way beyond just that one project, right? So talk to me, if you would, about, about, about some of the other projects that Ocean is, is sort of thinking about that, that involve similar kinds of things if it's not classified, you know? <laughs> Actually, just this morning, or yesterday, I was talking to Mark, I said, uh, somebody sent out some information on different types of plants. I was asking Mark, can we use this to help identify different plants? Like if somebody's in the field, can they just take a picture of a plant and identify it if they have a thousand different plants they need to identify? Mm -hmm. Can it be used for that? And I asked Mark, well, <laughs> I th yeah, I think I've even heard of at least some systems that are that are trying to do right. that, some databases and all that they, that you can upload you know, your picture to, and it will give you the best matches that, right. that it finds. But yeah, or animals, right? If you're out there, rather than carrying, you know, rather if you're out there snorkeling, you don't have to carry one of those little plastic cards with all the pictures of the fish on them, right? You just snap a picture of fish and right. so, upload it. Yeah. So. Uh, when I gave him the answer, basically the answer was yes. I mean, today, hmm. machine vision is so smart. So the, basically, you know, whenever you, you, your human brain can see it, it's most likely that uh, machine vision can do it as well. Right. It's that good today. And you know, it's one of these things people don't think about how, how marvelous and, and amazing our vision is. That is, we can identify a plant, say a rose, no matter what way you see it. It can be facing away from you, facing towards you, facing up, facing down, and you'll still recognize it as a rose, right? But that's a very difficult visual challenge, right? I mean, those are lots of different patterns. They don't always have the same features showing. And for a computer vision to learn to pick that out and do so reliably, and that's the thing they're now getting, I gather, very, very good at, at some of that identification. Um, I gather using computer vision and machine learning to do to read uh, x-rays and radio, uh, radiological scans of people. And, and some of the machines now are getting in that particular field, I guess, better than the human readers. Basically, they can spot smaller features more quickly. They can process huge amounts of data. They don't get bored. I mean, that must be incredibly tedious work. You know? <laughs> uh, and that's one of the beauties, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, I, and I saw you, you, had, you had something on here about uh, coffee bean quality control you know, as, as another project. So tell me about that. Yeah, so we had a project where we helped identify ripe coffee beans versus coffee beans that were not ripe yet. So it helped the coffee industry pick oh. the beans that are ripe with using machine vision. Oh, okay, so it's looking at trees, coffee trees basically, and judging the ripeness of the crop. And, right. Oh, okay, I was thinking of once they're all processed, it's gonna be pretty, even running fast, they're gonna, gonna be a, a long time to sort through individual beans, but just looking at the whole tree, I can see that. Uh, a much more efficient way to do it. I have some friends in the Big Island who are coffee farmers, mm -hmm. and they told me that um, you know going to something like uh, seasonal like coffee, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the season, uh, the requirement or the demand for labor changes, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it is one of the problems to secure labor. So um, you know, machine vision and AI could be a big problem and a big uh, help for them. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought labor. about that, but right, it, it can tell you probably. These, these trees here are going to be ready three or four days. Right. These trees over here, it's going to be eight or nine days. So you can now get your labor force lined up right. properly to go to the right sections of your coffee plantation right. at the right times, with the right numbers of people, the right amount right. of 
So there are Hawaii-specific yeah. problems like that, but you know, it, it's, I think it's uh, important for us to be able to talk to the people who need them, potentially need them, and mm -hmm. give them what we can do, what machine um, vision can do, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, work with them. Right. And again, I mean, this goes, it goes just in so many different areas, right? I, I understand they're using uh, some of the same kind of uh, processing for looking at uh, sort of astronomical, cosmological views. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just these big masses of stars, and you want to be able to pick out certain patterns within them that indicate certain things, whether the, the universe is expanding or not, say. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's very time consuming, rather subtle visual stuff. That for people to do it is going to take a long time for people to train the people to get them to do it to get them to do it for long periods of time reliably is is sort of tremendously difficult very expensive very sort of human capital intensive whereas once you put the time and energy into getting your machine to learn this it'll do it you know in a heartbeat forever and a day right and it's not going to ask for coffee breaks or <laughs> overtime or anything like that right? <laughs> when ai figures that out you know yeah, we're going to be in trouble, right? <laughs> well, there will be other jobs, <laughs> definitely. Uh, we will need more creativity, and then we, we're, we're still really good at creativity and uh, empathy. You know, there will be always room for humans. Well, that, yeah, that brings up a really interesting point. People are very, some people are very afraid of artificial intelligence or machine learning taking over large numbers of tasks and putting human beings out of work, making us redundant for a whole lot of things. And certainly, there's going to be changes, right? The people. 20 years from now, some of the tasks we do today, 20 years from now, are going to be done by machines routinely, right? right. Uh, yeah, I think whenever a new technology is introduced, there is always that threat. But usually, there's always, on the other hand, new jobs that are created for an ancillary you know, need for, for that technology. So I, I wouldn't worry in this case. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 20 years ago, nobody thought about teaching coding as, as a big thing, right? And now. We believe every elementary kid in the world, I think, is learning to code, right? right. I think in South Korea, they've now... Mandatory. Put, yeah, it's mandatory for as a course all through K-12, virtually. Uh, yeah, uh, because I understand that's, that's going to be a, a big thing going forward, and that's a skill which, <clears throat> again, is probably not going to fall out of date too fast, although eventually AI will be able to take over and start doing all the coding, too. But <laughs> so... Um, where, where, do you, where do you see this going? I mean, this, this sort of seems like it's a field with awesome potential. Yeah, I think there's a huge potential for different kinds of applications. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we love to find out and identify other applications. And we use mm -hmm. a process at Oceanet uh, called design thinking, which came from Stanford's uh, design school. Mm -hmm. But like Mark mentioned, it's really an empathy-based technique where we try to find out what people's core problems are and where their pain is and try to design solutions around that. But by using that technique, we usually start at a very small scale and prototype and test really quickly to see if we can, you know, our technology can help them. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, good, good prototyping is incredibly valuable. But that you bring up a very interesting point, too, on one of the worries about artificial intelligence and machine learning is how do you how do you teach morality or ethics to these machines, right? Um, there are certain areas that are so uh, no-brainer, easy to tell that it's a good thing. For example, you know, a good example is actually, uh, um, you know, a pole damage detection, you know, things like that, to just to simply help people, help you know, people's lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that uh, that's so easy to, you know, you know, to say that it's a good thing, you know. Right, but I mean, the classic issue for, right. say, autonomous vehicles is, you know, does it, if your car is faced with you know, running into a cement pole or hitting a group of people, you know, which, which is it going to do? Is it going to protect the occupants of the car or, or try to protect the bystanders more? And right. how, how does it make that judgment? Who gets to decide how it makes that, that judgment? And sort of what, even more deeply, what's the process by which that decision is made, right? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's going to be all kinds of interesting, uh, interesting challenges coming forward, and lots of opportunity for smart people to be thinking about this, right? And, and right. Help, helping, again, helping ensure that this is, technology does get used for good and not for, not for nefarious purposes, right? Yeah, I mean you're right. That drone video that you showed. Mm -hmm. I mean we are identifying poles, but there's other data in that, those images. So oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so people have to be careful about how that data is used and applied. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I, uh, somebody gonna hold that, could see that as an opportunity to go looting, right? Because, right. hey, here's an area that's damaged, that has no power, or houses, alarm systems are all gonna be down, you know, I, I can go in there. Yeah, so again, you've got, as with most technologies, right, there, is, there, there are ways they can be applied for good and ways they can be applied for not so good purposes, right? And that's part of your challenge, I guess, is trying to keep steering it always to the, to the, the, the beneficial ones, the, the ones that are, are appropriate and, and help humanity as, as a whole, right? Right. I think it was, I, I can't remember who said this, but it was a famous quote that says, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it, right? <laughs> so, I mean, in a sense, that's what we're trying to do at Oceanet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, no, it's, it's very admirable work. It, it, it's a little scary, I'd imagine. Sometimes you, you're, you really are out here on this, this sort of cutting edge of technology of wondering, you know, who, who's going to take this and do what with it now? Um, right. And, you know, things, things get away from people, too, and get, get used for... Uh, yeah, I, I've just been reading a biography of Albert Einstein, and he was mm -hmm. quite conflicted uh, the, the whole E yeah. MC Square business where, where that when that got taken off into weaponizing that particular little right. insight uh, right. you know was, was deeply he was a very avowed pacifist for much of his life but yeah um, all right well, well amazing stuff amazing stuff so uh, if you guys had had to give a brief advice to today's students about what what, they, what should they learn how, how to prepare for worthwhile careers, what would, you, what would you say? One thing, Mark is actually just starting to put together a course on AI and machine vision. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. It was pretty cool. I, I took his course. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of prototyping the course to see how it would work out. But it was fun. Cool. Can you give us a 30 second uh, version of that? Uh, sure. So we work with the Kamehameha schools to uh, offer this AI um, uh, workshops to uh, not just students but also adults and teachers mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs. Uh, we we try to simplify it just to give them some ideas and you know, um, you know, just good good intuition. That's good enough. So yeah. and, ma and we made it fun. Cool, excellent. Well, it sounds very exciting. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I, I've I've learned a lot. I have better appreciation for what your technology can do and for the, the challenges you guys face and the wonderful things you've accomplished. Thanks to you. Thanks to Oceanet. And uh, thanks to you for watching another episode of Likeable Science. So we'll be back next week. Until then, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii.